This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Hello. I think I can safely say that Mark Steele is not a right-wing comedian. Indeed, in his recent Radio 4 sitcom Unite, it's been suggested that he was typecast as a left-wing dad in a relationship with a middle-class partner. I don't think my character is me. I really hope not, because my character's quite a bumptious chap, really, and, God, I really hope it's not me. Well, see what you think. When we come together in a bunch, we're a fist. Because when we stand together, we can defeat this filthy band of money-grubbing tyrants. And that was his character's wedding speech. And it was written by Mark and his son Elliot. In feedback this week, I'll be talking to the author and comedian about that situation comedy and about his long-running, much-loved and often quite rude, or should I say just cheeky series, Mark Steele's In Town. I'll ask him how he gets away with risque jokes about the places he visits, like this one. In Douglas, capital of the Isle of Man, and it is wonderful to be in a place with such a, a positive attitude, even during a global recession, with the sense to invest in one of the few industries still booming, fiddling tax. <laughs> And our out-of-your-comfort-zone listeners give their views on a new radio comedy from someone who calls himself a centrist dad, desperate to avoid political jokes which he considers too serious, too boring. Is he right? I would disagree that comedy is bad because it's political. Surely politics cuts into every aspect of life. I don't think centrism has a place in comedy. I didn't really get the point of the programme. Did our listeners like anything about centrist dad? More importantly, did they laugh? Find out later in Feedback. The comedian Mark Steele is probably best known to the Radio 4 audience for his long-running series Mark Steele's In Town, and I'm delighted to say he's joined me to talk about that and also about his recent sitcom, Unite, about a working-class man, guess who, in a relationship with a middle-class partner. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us, Mark. Let's start by trying to find out what sort of comedian you are, because later in the programme we've got somebody who calls himself a centrist dad. Well, you're clearly not that. What sort of comic are you? A comic I know once who was on a programme and she said, comic isn't my job, it's my species. And uh, (laughs) I think that's it with comics. But, I mean, you know, a lot of people go on at the moment about BBC comedy is too left-wing and BBC needs to find right-wing comedy. I mean, it's your view they just should find people who are funny. I think that sort of attaching left or right to comedy is sort of to misunderstand it. And the left can make this mistake as much as the right, assuming that what a comic's doing is just going to be saying something that's going to back up their own point of view. Whereas, really, I think usually what a comic's trying to do is say the mischievous thing, the naughty thing in the room that's going to be a bit provocative. Well, you're now to sitcom territory. You've just had a first series of a new comedy called Unite. This is what some of our listeners think about it. Here's a couple. Susan Lester from Middlewich in Cheshire. The Mark Steele lecture has taught me a lot. And as for Unite, I was a little unsure at first, but quickly warmed to it. A proper 6.30 Radio 4 programme. The differences between the two parents and their offsprings is so well played out and the final wedding was so good. Another series, please. Graham Rice from Northamptonshire. Mark Steele's in town is one of the few genuinely funny comedy shows on Radio 4. An American friend who's never even heard of most of the towns visited enjoys it too. Sad to say his sitcom is no better than the others in which a stand-up pretends to be an actor. Because when we stand together, we can defeat this filthy band of money-grubbing tyrants that own and control the banks and the rest of all everything, squeezing the life out of everyone, literally murdering us by the billions and build a new world of hope and freedom. And that's what being married to Imogen means to me. Uh, Also, I'd like to thank Maureen for the cake. Well, why did you want to be an actor, Mark Steele, in this sitcom? Or do you always think of yourself as an actor? 
Yeah, I think most comics think of themselves as actors, but I think, first of all, I've got to say that that is possibly one of the most most difficult moments you can have in this job, which is to be on feedback with you saying, this is what some of our listeners have had to say about your programme. <laughs> That's like being a boxer at the end of the fight, waiting to see if the referee's going to hold your hand up or the other one. Oh, God, that was nerve-wracking. <laughs> But did you, I mean, why did you want to do Unite? Because a lot of people say you're very brave to do it since you're sending yourself up something rotten in the character you play. Yeah, well, that's fun, though, isn't it? I I don't think my character is me in that. I really hope not because my character's quite a bumptious chap, really. And I suppose it's a way, the the programme, of trying to see all the different angles of age and class represented in there. You wrote it with your son, Elliot, and I wondered whether you looked at the character that you had to play and asked him to soften it or anything else, or saying, is this really what you think of your dad? No, it's great writing it with Elliot, and uh, great because he has a sort of young person's perspective on it. Jobs, for example, you know, if you're our age, you know, I was brought up at a time when a job was something that defined you, that you did, and that's what you were for your life. I'm going to be a plumber or I'm going to be an accountant or whatever. And now a job isn't that if you're 21. A job is something that you're going to be doing if you're lucky for about a year and a half until the thing you're doing is closed down and then you have to get another one, you know. So my lad plays Ashley and he does various jobs in the first series. He was the marketing manager for a chicken nuggets type place in one of them and when he got there that job entailed dressing up in a chicken outfit and handing out leaflets <laughs> maybe if this maybe if we get enough criticism from listeners then we'll all have to go and do jobs like that <laughs> well i i mean mentioned the first series has it been recommissioned as a series oh no i don't know i hope so and the last episode ended on a wedding, which, in a sense, you know, knitted a lot together. But do you think there's a lot more potential there? Yeah, I think so. Ladies and gentlemen, the group. Uh, thank you. Ladies, gentlemen, comrades, brothers and sisters, uh, first, may I thank you for, for all dressing up. Uh, so smart today. Most of you haven't made this much effort since last time you were in in court. It was brilliant fun doing it. And we had sort of really lovely people like Marcus Brigstock and Simon Greenall and people like that being in it and Kevin Eldon. And yeah, so it was really, really good fun doing it. I really hope we do another one. And I hope we can win over Graham. I think that in the the argument about comics being actors, I think generally... Most comics, not all, but most comics are sort of not bad actors. Yes, some people say that what you've got is a comic, particularly if you don't stand up. You have a sense of timing, which a lot of actors have difficulty in learning. You have to learn it as a comic. And so you've got that element of self confidence and knowing how to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, most comics in your act, you're doing characters. The other thing is that you have to convince an audience <laughs> every night when you're doing the show that you're saying this for the first time. I think if it's going really well, people assume you're just getting up and just chatting. But I don't try to analyse these things too much. Our thanks to Mark, and uh, we'll be hearing more from him later in the programme. And his comedy, Unite, is available on BBC Sounds. So do let us know your thoughts about that interview or, of course, anything else to do with BBC Radio and podcasts. Corey has the details of how you get in touch. You can send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk or write a letter. The address is feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London, SE1P 4AX. You can follow our activity on Twitter by using at BBCR4Feedback or you can call us and leave a phone message on 0333 444 Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. All those details are on our website. In a few minutes, we'll have the second part of our interview with Mark Steele, when we'll be talking about his In Town series and whether any more are planned. But first, a very different comedian is under scrutiny. (laughs) 
Each week, we're asking two BBC Radio listeners to step out of their comfort zones and listen to a programme that wouldn't normally be on their radar. This week, we have Trudy Tukasik from Glasgow and Jack Lighty from Croydon. Well, Trudy, to get a sense of your usual tastes in radio, what would be your top three programmes if you were stranded on a desert island? Dead Ringers, Newscast and The Archers. The Archers? Even for someone as young as you, yes, right, OK. Uh, what about you then, Jack? Uh, your top three programmes if you were on Desert Island? My top three are You and Yours, PM and Desert Island Discs. Well, we asked you to listen, of course, to none of those programmes, but instead to Alan Cochran, centrist dad, you've got to remember the question mark there, part of a series of stand-up specials on Radio 4 and available via BBC Sounds. <laughs> oh dear, some of you might be enjoying my observations about the kitchen more than you'll perhaps enjoy Alan 2.0. <laughs> The world has changed since I did that show and so this stand-up special is going to be different because recently I've noticed that comedy and society, or me, have seemingly managed to make absolutely everything political! (laughs) Now, the Radio Times describes this one as another attempt by the BBC to redress alleged left-wing bias in comedy. Well, before we get there, Jack, uh, how would you describe the programme? Explain what it's all about. This is a stand-up special, half-an-hour programme by Alan Cochrane, who is basically contending that public life in the UK has been taken hostage by a small online Twitter mob, a bunch of cultural warriors who have basically moved this idea of acceptable policies to the political left, which he disagrees with. And he kind of likens it to being on a train. He's on one train and the other train is pulling out of the station. and He feels a little bit disorientated. He doesn't quite know what's happened or when it started happening, but he started to feel perhaps a little bit um, disenfranchised. And Trudy, do you think that it was uh, lived up to its billing, Sentry's dad? Question mark. I think it was a bit misrepresented and kind of trying to say he was right wing, which his point was he wasn't and that there was issues that maybe he sat across different divides, left or right. And I think the point he was trying to make was it is very difficult just to say you are left wing, you are right wing, because there are issues that will cut across different sides of things. I must confess, sometimes I watch the news and find myself agreeing with the people I keep getting told are the baddies. So what's a man to do? The obvious answer would be to keep his mouth shut and do his jokes about sausages and washing machines and the weird little moments in life like he used to. The less smart answer would be to confess to his broadly centrist and actually liberal thought crimes and make permanent enemies of right-wing people and the whole of the comedy circuit who seem to see anyone to the right of Chairman Mao as an enemy of progress. (laughs) So, Jack, when we talk about sort of left-wing or right-wing comedy, I mean, there are some people who are proud to be called left-wing comics. I think Mark Steele, for example, although I don't think you can tell that when he goes around different parts of the country and he's just hilarious, but he would like to think of himself sometimes as a a left-wing comic. But on the whole, it's what makes people laugh, and therefore it's got to reflect some sort of reality comedy that's going on in in people's lives to work. So does the term left and right wing on all make much sense when it comes to comedy? It's funny or it's not. I don't tune in to comedy programming with a political lens generally. I mean, of course, you have places like the news quiz, you have dead ringers. You're tuning into those programs with a political mindset. But there are also other comedy programs like It's a Fair Cop or Conversations from a Long Marriage where you are not tuning in with a political mindset. These are just programs that about a slice of life that cuts across all social class, ethnicity, that can be enjoyed by everybody. But my point is this, I don't feel like Mondeo Man or Workington Man or even like that much of a centrist. I have varied opinions on lots of issues and they end up landing me in the centre. Centrism can be very broadly defined as a position that is against political change that would result in a significant shift of society strongly to either left or right. At least that's what Wikipedia says. But I find Wikipedia to be a bit like a really clever friend who's been drinking so much wine their mouth has gone red. But he calls it uh, Alan Cochran centrist dad, question mark, not right wing dad, question mark. Do you think there is a place, such a place as centrism in comedy or is that nonsense? So I think it's very hard to separate people and their personality and comedy from politics in general. 
but that's just my view. <laughs> what, you would actually prefer comedians to be right-wing rather than centrist? I mean, perhaps you might prefer them left. What do you mean is you like them to have a definite attitude, do you? A definite political approach? Um, I would disagree that comedy is bad because it's political, because comedy talks about life and different things in life. You can't really separate that from politics because politics cuts into every aspect of life. In the end, you know, let's forget the politics. Did you laugh? And did you laugh a lot, Jack? <laughs> I did a little bit. <laughs> yeah, there were a range of jokes in there. There was uh, we had a joke about Dick Francis's name, and then we went on to a joke about the Invisible Hand. So there was there was a, you know a, a range of comedy in there. <laughs> what about you, Trudy? It was better than I thought it was going to be because I thought, well, here we go. It's BBC trying to do its whole thing. We were not you know just on the left, but actually it was a lot better. It wasn't what I was expecting it to be. So I felt that it was a bit awkward. The program because I, I don't think centrism it has a place in comedy. I didn't really get the point of the programme. It, it's difficult enough doing stand-up in front of an audience is there in front of you, but on the other hand, if you get them going, that must be a big help. But Alan Cochran was, like I suppose a lot of comedians now, had to have a virtual audience. And they were there out there, but they were not in the room with him, as I understand it, which you know, must make it very difficult, mustn't it? I think he wouldn't have had the audience response initially. It would have been harder to see it and to play off of that and maybe interact with the audience at times. But I think he still did really well. Um, I mean, it wasn't barely laugh out loud, but I did chortle. I did roll my eyes and think, oh, I know what he means. <laughs> um, that kind of thing. I did feel at times a little bit left out because I felt that some of the laughter tracked a little bit before the actual gag itself. So I wondered if maybe he's a better visual performer, you know, in, in this case on Zoom, then he perhaps is a radio broadcaster. But it, it was amusing, yeah. Well, we come down to the last question we always ask, which is, uh, were you out of your comfort zone on this? I'll ask you a second one, which is whether you think the Radio 4 should have more of Alan Cochran. But let's start anyway, Jack, out of your comfort zone or not? I was out of my comfort zone, and I won't be listening again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, what about Trudy? Out of your comfort zone, will you be listening again? Um, I suppose I was out of my comfort zone in that I would tend to listen to panel shows rather than a lot of stand-up comedy and he probably wasn't someone I knew but I actually really enjoyed it and if he was on again I would be quite pleased and have a wee listen and see what he was he was up to. <laughs> and, and you're not at all influenced by the fact that although he seems to talk with a Yorkshire accent he was in fact born proudly in Scotland. <laughs> you don't tend to hear much um, Scottish accents on the radio do you? <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to Trudy Tukasik and to Jack Lytle. And do let us know if you would like to be put out of your comfort zone. Now back to someone who by no stretch of the imagination could be called a centrist dad. His series, Mark Steele's In Town, has been running on Radio 4 for over a decade. In it, as you must know, Mark visits a town or city and performs a stand-up routine to an audience who are regaled with local anecdotes and are good-humouredly insulted. This is what some of you think of the programme. Evie Sharp from Bingley, West Yorkshire. I used to listen to Radio 4's 6.30 comedy in the car with my dad on the way to various youth groups when I was around 10 or 11. I'm 19 now. I particularly enjoyed Mark Steele's In Town as I found it really funny and it got me into radio comedy as well as comedy in general. Thank you, Mark. Deborah Valance. Mark Steele's lectures and regional visits are well-researched and very funny. He's an original thinker, a rare commodity, and his gentle irony is good-humoured but never cruel. The fact that he's still on the BBC shows the BBC still has some editorial independence from the government. <laughs> oh, that's very funny that this is sort of... that, that the in-town show is a, is a little bit of independence from the government. Oh, one day... Boris Johnson will be ringing up and saying, Mark, I insist that you uh, that you do the town of uh, of Winchester. Well, he might say Uxbridge or somewhere, yes, or even Henley. I mean, in town, it's an outrageous concept. You go up somewhere, you stand in front of people, you insult them, and you get managed to get them to laugh at each other in an extraordinary way. Have you ever stood up and thought, I can't do this? Well, I think for the first few series, almost every show we did about 20 minutes before going out in front of the audience, I would look at the script and think, 
I can't do this. This is so rude. I'm going to go out there and, and say something just awful about these people. And uh, I'd think, oh, maybe I should soften it or something. And then I'd think, no, that's that's the worst thing. That's the rudest thing of all to do. And there was just one time when it threatened to go wrong, which was in the Isle of Man. And it is wonderful to be in a place with such a, a positive attitude, even during a global recession, with the sense to invest in one of the few industries still booming, fiddling tax. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of this week's Mark Stories in Town. I might be being unfair, of course. <laughs> And I thought, oh, no, no, this is a disaster. I, I just said, well, look, there's another hour of that, I'm afraid. And then they clapped and it was all right. And they were lovely. They were really, really lovely. But I suppose it's a bit like in life, isn't it? If you say something that's so outrageous, it's clearly a joke. And you clearly are saying it affectionately. Then people don't mind. When um, my brilliant producer, Carl Cooper, had the idea of, like, let's do one in Gibraltar. And as he said it, I said, the opening line, in, if we do Gibraltar, has got to be how marvellous it is at last to be able to do this programme in Spain. Oh, no, no, I'm only joking, Gibraltar. I don't mean to be insensitive at all. Please let me introduce myself properly and politely. Bienvenidos a Max Delzica. Que esta semana ha venido a exótico Gibraltar. Es tan emocionante venir hasta España. But you do take an extraordinary number of risks. So when you went to my home city of Carlisle, I mean, you were straight into the Wigton smell nearby. The point about it is, you know, we're quite touchy in Carlisle, quite touchy, quite defensive sometimes. And, you know, you managed to poke them and they all laughed with you. I'm still surprised about how you do that. They know, they now know, I suppose, what they're going to get. And it's sort of an honour to be made fun of, given all the other places. Uh, and I, I say this as a friend, Carlisle... You stinker biscuits. <laughs> uh, one of the first conversations I had when I came here was in the bookcase bookshop and someone honestly said to me as an opening line, what you notice about Carlisle is it smells a lot better than Wigton. <laughs> Judith Hudson from Pristine. I like to ask, does Mark do the research into the towns that he visits himself? Or does he have a team of researchers out there looking for people or events that he feels would be of interest to the listeners? It's just me and, and the producer, Carl, that's it. And then people in the areas, you know, you find people in the areas who just love showing you round. I remember this one, when we did Bungie about sort of seven or eight years ago, lovely, fascinating little place in Suffolk, and we were at the bed and breakfast and the guy who was worked in the bed and breakfast come over and he said, so when's the BBC coming then? And we said, well, that's us. And he said, yeah, but when's the BBC coming? And I said, no, it's just us, us two. And he goes, right, but the BBC's coming, isn't it? And I thought, oh, you've, you've heard the BBC. You think this massive lorry's going to arrive <laughs> with, like, catering crew and, and uh, costume people and makeup people and people shouting at each other. And it's just me and the producer. That really is all it is. I, I really, I'm very flattered by that question of, is there a team? So how long do you spend in a place before you record the show? Well, I go up there for a day and get all the books and meet people and all that sort of thing. And then if it's possible, then I'll go back again a second time for maybe another day. And then I sort of speak to people on the phone and I know when it's time to start actually putting it all together because by then I'm obsessed by the place and can't stop boring people about Basingstoke or whatever. And then we go back up there for another two, maybe three days before the recording and go around all the things, the, you know, the museums and the daft things and spend an hour and a half with a, in Melton Mowbray with a man who was well known as the bloke who always lectured people on how to make a pork pie, things like that. Well, we've got another question from Judith Hudson. Is there a script for the interviews or is it just Mark's particular kind of unscripted repartee that he achieves because of his personality? Uh, yes, yeah, so there is a script. So, yeah, so we write it out, but we're writing it right up until half an hour before we do it, really. I don't stick completely to it. And then when, when I'm talking to people in the shows, you don't know what they're going to say. So they are just brilliantly, infectiously warm and funny and really all I'm doing is just holding a mic to them, I think. 
And, and are you tired of the series? Can you see yourself stopping or do you just want to go on? I mean, obviously, the last 18 months I've not been able to do one. I got a brilliant message, I think someone sent me on Twitter, that seemed really serious, that said, Mark, why haven't you done a series over the last year? Have you stopped doing them? <laughs> but I think that's just... <laughs> I just got a oh, what a virus. I don't know. I don't really keep up with the news. We were able to do a couple during the pandemic, and possibly my favourite moment, which could also have been the most frustrating, was in Stratford upon Avon. It was difficult to do because everything was shut. We weren't really allowed to meet anyone very much, and it was. I'd been wanting to Stratford upon Avon for ages, you know, just so I could start by saying Stratford upon Avon. <laughs> A beautiful, pretty town, but one that is unusual in that no one famous has ever come from here at all. <laughs> the only person of note with any connection to the town is William Shakespeare. But the wonderful thing is that you don't make a big thing of it because, <laughs> because the odd shop does make a subtle reference to Shakespeare if you can get the clues. There's a butcher's I saw at a sign that said to beef or not to beef. There's a cat cafe called Shake's Paw. There's probably a plumber's called As You Leak It. And a, a chiropodist called Two I just wonder, the other thing is, I know you don't want to overanalyse this, but you know more about this country in many ways than almost anybody else, don't you, as a result of all this? The rest of us don't travel the way you do, but more importantly, we don't sort of talk to people and listen to them in the way you did. Have you changed as a result of doing this series, do you think? Uh, yeah, maybe I have, actually. Maybe I've become sort of... What I really love doing is doing a programme where, at the end of it, people think well of people. I really prefer that to loads of people listening to it and thinking, yeah, it's made me really angry and now I want to go and set fire to something. I much prefer that people go, oh, I really really like Hebden, the idea of Hebden Bridge. I think I'm going to go... And that's, I'm very flattered when people say, oh, we... Someone's going to get a message saying, oh, we... I'd never really been to Wigan before, but after listening to your programme, <laughs> I, w- I went up there. <laughs> Our thanks to Mark Steele, who graciously took time away from his near-obsessional interest in the Olympic coverage to talk to us. And that's almost all for feedback. Last week, some listeners were critical of BBC News for its coverage of South Africa. This week, news bosses will have been delighted to learn from the broadcasting regulator Ofcom that the BBC suite of news offerings across radio, TV and online reaches a combined audience of 83% of the population, more than anyone else. The World Service remains particularly trusted, which may explain why in China, BBC journalists are being given a particularly hard time. The truth there is clearly uncomfortable. Good news, too, for Archer's fans as well. Uh, At the moment, as you know, they're down to four episodes. Well, they're going back up to five on Sunday, the 15th of August. They hope to go to six, of course, but not sure when. So that's all from feedback. Until next time, keep on keeping safe. Goodbye.